Those in the energy sector continue to feel the pain from uh, the low price of oil globally and weak demand. Uh, and that showed up in the quarterly results for both Synovus and its acquisition target, Husky Energy. Alex Porbe is the CEO of Synovus. He's with us now. Thank you very much for being with us. Appreciate your time. No worries. Glad to be here, Amanda. So, Alex, I really want to start with, and I say in the context of the quarter, which we saw, you know, obviously both uh, Synovus and Husky hit by various aspects of the weakness that you've been undergoing here, weak oil price, weak demand, um, you know, the effects of a pandemic. Is this a transaction that would have happened at any other time? Uh, in other words, would this have made sense for Synovus uh, three years ago? Yeah, Amanda, I, I completely believe it, it would have. And, you know, I, so I, although the, the pandemic, I, I wouldn't say in any way was a trigger to get the deal done. You know, the impact on commodity prices certainly, I think, was uh, uh, help, helped, I, I think, me uh, to see the value of, of driving quickly towards a, a lower cost, more integrated, less volatile uh, business, business strategy. So now let's put that in the context of what we see in the in the quarter. How uh, what does that integration look like? How much is there between here and there to get you to a slim down, uh, I guess, kind of leaner entity that can manage the, the environment that you're dealing with? Yeah, uh, Amanda, I, th I think if you th there's lots of rationale for doing the deal, but one of the biggest rationales was really this concept of creating a more integrated entity uh, from the wellhead uh, all the way to the refinery. And as a result of that, we're now in a situation if, if, if we deliver on the promises we've made with respect to integration and synergies, uh, we will have a much stronger entity, way almost almost uh, uh, minimal exposure to heavy oil pricing in Alberta uh, are all in free cash flow break even will drop down to about $33 a barrel, which will make us one of the most cost competitive producers in North America. And we mm -hmm. should see our balance sheet improve quicker and the volatility of our cash flow uh, uh, subside markedly as a result of the combination. And on that front, what are you telling investors about the balance sheet and uh, your focus on debt and paying down debt? Well, look, I, I obviously, uh, I mean, we're not unique. I think pretty much every every uh, upstream, even the integrated companies, have packed on a lot of debt uh, during this incredibly low price environment due to the pandemic. And you know, so Husky and Sonovas have both. Uh, have both had that challenge. I know on our side, significantly this quarter, we've been able to get back on the, the debt repayment. Our debt came down materially uh, this past quarter, down to about seven and a half billion dollars. But once you put these companies together, uh, we should see that combined debt uh, drop uh, much quicker than either of the two companies could have done on their own. You are also both taking impairment charges. You're writing down, we've seen this across the whole energy sector, of course, as, as you would note. Uh, this is not unusual. Are you, uh, are you cleaning up in a way that prepares you for some potential upside if we do see uh, you know, the, uh, the big rebound in the, in the economy and therefore in demand for oil? No, I, I, I mean, that, that, that wasn't part of it. I, I, from our perspective, it was purely, you know, every quarter we, we take a look, uh, we do an impairment analysis of all of our assets. And in this case, in, in particular, uh, one of our refining assets in the U.S. that we're partnered with, Phillips 66, uh, when you do that analysis, it indicated that uh, uh, it was appropriate to take a write down. So it really was not, it was in no way, shape or form was it related to any kind of setting up for recovery. You did, I mean, we talked about and analysts have underscored that this brings your combined cost uh, production down. So it does allow you a little more flexibility, even with a pressured price of oil. How, how worried are you, though, about the commodity price, uh, which, you know, could we have seen it go lower if we go back to full lockdown? It, it could indeed. And there's all kinds of talk in the industry about uh, sort of that we've passed, obviously, peak demand and that it's on the backside of its uh, of its heyday. How do you factor that into the value? Value of the of the combined company. <laughs> you, you, you know, Amanda, I, on that first issue or the the last issue about sort of peak oil, 
you know, we've been hearing that for a, for a great many years. I, I personally don't believe that. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect that once we have a safe, effective and widely available vaccine for uh, the coronavirus, I, I expect that we're going to see people globally go back to the same kind of activities they did before. And I, I would be very surprised to see oil demand kind of go back, uh, fail to go back to where it was historically. And I, I, I suspect uh, certainly uh, uh, our view and, and the view of most of the commentators that I see is that uh, our, although we may see some diversification of energy sources going forward, I, I'd be very, very surprised uh, to see a material reduction in, in oil demand uh, in the world over the next 30 to 40 years. I, I think it, it's with us in, the, in that kind of period. And, you know, in terms of, of what it does uh, for, or how I look at it, as I said, I think once we have that vaccine, I really do think we're kind of going back uh, somewhat to business as, as usual. And in the interim, you know, you know we've created this, this, uh, this entity and you, you look at it from Sonovas's perspective, uh, it is taking our all in, uh, cash flow or break evens from $38 a barrel down to $33 a barrel in 2023. So that is that's not just a modest improvement. That that's an extraordinary reduction in our in our costs. Indeed. Um, it, so when you combine the fact that you uh, you know you're, that that will be a benefit to you, you're also a believer, as many with long perspective in the energy sector uh, are believers that this is a cyclical industry and it'll come back. Where does that leave you with asset sales? I mean, we understand that there may be some and that there are some kind of obvious uh, assets that you might hive off of the combined entity. Do you do you do those sooner rather than later, or do you wait for a normalization of the picture, including oil prices? Well, that, that's, that's the big challenge, Amanda. I mean, by, by the time this deal closes and probably well before it, we will have identified exactly what assets are, are core and which assets are non-core. And then the, the, the real issue is, is the timing. And, and for me, that's really going to depend on our assessment of uh, what, how is the market and can we actually achieve divestitures that, that we think represent fair value for our shareholders. But we will definitely be on close in a, in a position to, uh, to make those moves in the, in the event that uh, we, we come to the conclusion uh, it's good market timing to do so. There are also new questions about the long-term future for White Rose. Can you give us some guidance on, on what you expect will happen there? Well, I know I know Husky has taken the position that you know they're taking a hiatus in uh, in 2021. I mean, I, I just you know it, we look at, at the project. It, it's a very important project, but at, at the same time, right now uh, at this kind of of uh, oil prices, uh, it is a very very challenged project. And you know, unless we see something really materially uh, change there, uh, I think it's it's going to be a challenge for us to uh, put, put uh, material capital to that project going forward. All right, and I do want to ask you, Alex, you know, we, we've heard uh, a lot from the federal government about help to Canadians and Canadian business, and now they're turning their attention to kind of the future. Uh, we haven't seen industry-specific aid for either airlines or energy. Uh, can you reflect on what might be different if there had been more support from the federal government in Canada's energy sector? Well, I, you know, I think it's a tribute to the, to the energy sector that uh, it has largely uh, been able to get through to, to this point. And I mean, the, you know, the really big companies like, like Synovus and, and our peers in the industry, you know, we have ample liquidity uh, and, and, you know, we were able uh, to, make it, to make it through this incredibly tough time. But it's a real challenge, uh, especially for the mid to smaller size uh, uh, players and and I worry particularly as we as we uh, kind of are clearly moving into a second wave. Uh, I think it it is going to continue to be very very important for the federal government to see if these programs that they have announced if they can be made available uh, to to a lot of the, those players because I I worry it could be tough uh, if they don't have access to liquidity. All right, we got to leave it there. It is great to have you with us. Really appreciate your time, Alex. Alex Porbe is the CEO of Sonovis.